I wanted to continue tonight along uh, the topic of miracles. We've been studying the various accounts of miracles in the Bible, and God loves to show up and show out on behalf of those whose hearts are fully his. You know, there have been periods of time throughout histories, uh, throughout history when miracles were more in demonstration and manifestation and times when they were less in demonstration and manifestation. And a lot of that depended upon the spiritual condition of God's people at any given time. And when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon in the Old Covenant, Gideon replied by asking why they had not seen miracles in their time. I won't ask you how many of you have wondered, why do we not see everything we, you know, we, we've heard people tell stories about. But I'll tell you, if you're a member here at Cornerstone, you, we've seen lots and lots and lots of miracles. And God said, 2020 is the year of miracles. But not everybody has seen them. Judges 6, 11 said, and there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was an Ophrah that pertained unto Joash the Abizarite and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, the Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? Listen to this. And where be all his miracles, which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now it seems the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Gideon had never seen a miracle in his lifetime, but that doesn't mean that God had quit performing them. No matter of fact, that's what that angel was there for. God was fixing to supernaturally, that's a good Alabama term, God was fixing to supernaturally deliver the people of God out. And so the angel came to Gideon. Why? Why had there been not as much demonstration in Gideon's time? We get a clue here in Judges 6.1. Back up from 6.11 where we began to verse 1. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. Down to verse 6 for time's sake. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto him, unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt, and I brought you forth out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of all that oppressed you, and drave them out before you, and gave you their land. And I said, said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. Now listen, obedience. We've already talked about that over the last several Wednesday nights. Obedience is a huge key to miracles. And when you seek after God with all of your heart, he shows up. Are you with me? How, how many miracles you see in your life has a lot to do with how hard you are or are not running after God. When you seek after God, he shows up. And when he shows up, all of him shows up. Second Chronicles 16.9 says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards him. The NIV says those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Oftentimes, how much of God we have in manifestation and demonstration 
in our lives is up to us. Listen, tonight, how much of him do you want? How much of him do you want? Is he a part of our everyday lives? Are we running after him? Or are we using him like a spare tire? Lord, if what I'm using every day doesn't work and things start to go wrong, that's when I I turn my eyes towards you and I ask you to get me out of this mess. No, we ought not be using God like a spare tire. He wants to walk with you and he wants to talk with you and he wants to do life with you. And because he loves you, he wants to show up and show out and demonstrate every single day of your life. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, and you shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all of your hearts. Listen, when you're seeking after God with all of your heart, he promised you would find him. And when you find him, you find all of his miracles, all of his provision, everything that he is, you get. I don't think very many people who are seeking God with all of their hearts and whose hearts are open to see them go very long without God showing up and showing out on their behalf. He comes, and when he comes, he works miracles and does supernatural things in our lives. So let me ask you tonight, what is going on in your life and situation? Are you seeking him? Are you asking him to intervene in the, in the natural course of your life every single day, or do you got this? Because if you got this, he's going to let you get it. I don't know about you. I don't want to take a breath in the morning without him being right there in the middle of it. I don't want to get out of bed without him being right there in the middle of everything that's going on. Psalms 44, 1 says, We have heard with our ears, O God. Our fathers have told us what work thou didst in their days in the times of old. Listen, are you just going to be content with hearing the stories of what God used to do? Or are we going to get him to do some of those fantastic things now? I tell you, I know a lot of you are already walking in it this year. I've heard your stories. Promotions with double pay, new jobs, better jobs, increase on every side, uh, inheritances in fantastic ways God is taking care of you in this hour. And I'm so glad, but I'm here tonight to remind you that there's more. There's more. I don't just want to hear the stories of the Azusa Street Revival where a severed hand grew back on right before everybody's eyes. Right before everybody's eyes, fingers came on that hand. Right before everybody's eyes, fingernails came on those fingers. Right in front of everybody's eyes, God painted their nails the same color as the other hand. I don't want to just hear about that. I want to see it. I don't just want to hear about, uh, you know, somebody being in the spirit and dancing off the platform in midair and not falling. With their eyes shut, they danced right off the platform, danced around in midair, turned around and danced right back on the stage, didn't even know what they'd done. I want there to be so much presence of God here that it gets the neighborhood's attention. At Azusa Street, I don't know how many times they called the fire department because flames were seen on their building, but there was no fire. It was the presence of God in manifestation. 
He fell in that place and shot out. And miles away, people would get off a train at that train station and they would fall on their knees repenting before God for their sins and getting right with God because of the presence of God that that church brought into the area. But I don't just want to hear about it. It's time. It's time for us to experience those things. The prophet Habakkuk himself cried out in a time of trouble. Habakkuk 3.2 in the New Living. I have heard all about you, Lord. I'm filled with awe by your amazing works. In this, the time of our deep need, help us again as you did in years gone by. But I want you to hear God's perspective. Psalms 81.10 out of the Amplified Classic. Psalm 81.10 in the Amplified Classic. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. He brought them out of captivity. Has he brought you out of captivity? He said, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. But my people would not hearken to my voice and Israel would have none of me. So I gave them up to their own heart's lust and let them go after their own stubborn will that they might follow their own counsels. If you want to live your own life, your own way, live after your own will and the counsel of your own heart, the Lord will let you. But I'm here tonight to tell you there's a higher way. There's a better way. This is a year of miracles. God declared 2020 right smack in the middle of all this mess. The year of miracles for us. Well, Pastor Rhonda, did he just not know what was coming? He knew full well. He knew full well. And he ordained that right in the middle of everything going on, that we, his people, would experience the miraculous power of God. How much of him do you want? How much of his counsel, how much of his counsel and his miraculous ways will you walk in? It's up to you. It's up to you. What's going on in your life? What's going on in your family situation? Are you looking to him to intervene or do you got this? We've looked at a number of different miracles over the months that we've been talking about them. Last week we talked about provisional miracles. We've talked about supernatural healings and miracles in bodies. God works all kinds of miracles based upon the needs in our life. Listen, whatever it is that you need, he's got the power to help you. What is it you need? What is it you need? Whatever that need is, are you just trying to figure it out on your own? Are you just trying to do what you think is best? Or are you seeking after him and his wisdom and his counsel and his ways with all of your heart? God works all kinds of miracles based upon what we need. 1 Samuel 1.1. 1, 1. Now there was a certain man of Ramathame Zophim, sure, of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, an Ephrathite. Oh yeah, you read it. And he had two wives. And the name of one of the wives was Hannah, and the name of the other was Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. 
For time's sake, we're going to go down to verse 6. The, in, the, in the interim there, they, they brought offerings every year, and Elkanah gave uh, you know, uh, uh, um, Penina and her kids uh, uh, a portion to give. But he gave unto Hannah a double portion because he loved her the most. And Penina knew that. That's a terrible thing, but it's true. Verse 6, so Penina was angry at Hannah. And it says, and her adversary also, her, Hannah, Hannah's adversary being Penina, also provoked her sore for to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore, she wept and did not eat. The Bible says year after year, this happened. And every year, Hannah would cry. And every year, Hannah would get depressed. And every year, Hannah would quit eating. And every year, Elkanah would try to make her feel better. But this year, something changed. 1 Samuel 1.10 and she, Hannah, was in bitterness of soul, and she prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. What happened? Hannah got sick of it. Hannah got tired of the status quo. Hannah got tired of crying every year. Hannah got tired of Penina being mean to her. And she took it finally to the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou will indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli marked her mouth. Eli the priest was watching her pray, and he could tell by her countenance the intensity that she was praying with. She was so beside herself in that prayer. I mean, she was ugly crying. She didn't care who saw her. She was going to fix it today. This was her year. Something had to change, and she was serious. Listen, desperation is not a bad thing. Desperation cuts the fluff. It cuts the fat out of your prayers and your life. I tell you, you can be a busy person, busy with this and that and the other thing, but when something happens that shoves you over the edge, you can get laser focused. Hannah had had enough. Reminds me of the man in the old covenant that they lowered down, uh, they took the roof off and they lowered him down. When it first talks about him, the Bible says he was sick of the palsy. And I know it means he was sick with the palsy. But I'd imagine he was also sick of the palsy. Sometimes you got to get sick and tired of being sick and tired. you got to get sick and tired of the devil uh, rubbing your nose and stuff and tormenting you and vexing your soul. And you just got to say, not anymore, it's enough. When you get sick and tired, it'll push you to your knees. When it pushes you to your knees, God responds with his power. In demonstration, she, uh, Hannah was so beside herself as she cried unto the Lord. Her, her, her lips were moving, but she was talking to God in her heart. She wasn't making any sound. And Eli, watching her, thought she'd come into the temple drunk. He said, girl, you got to quit drinking. She said, I am not drunk. I am crying out of the bitterness of my soul unto God. And Eli said, then may God give you what you desired. Verse 19, and they rose up in the morning early and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to their house to Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife. You know what that means. And the Lord remembered her. 
she said, Lord, remember me. And the scripture, verse 19, says the Lord remembered her. Did the Lord actually forget her? He didn't. It reminds me of when Pastor was in Chile for that nine-point-something earthquake. He jumped up and he said, Lord, I'm here. The Lord knew where he was. He just wanted God's attention. Yo! Hello! Sometimes you got to pray and get serious so that you know you got his attention. Because when God speaks, then you know that you've got the petitions that you've desired of him. Because you know he heard you. And if he heard you, then you know that you have the petitions you desired of him. Sometimes we just throw fluff and stuff prayers. You know, Lord, you know, fix this. Or Lord, you know, good grief, do something. Or, and we're not real serious. But when you get serious, God gets serious. Are you with me? Those words, remember me, were prayed often by women needing a supernatural intervention to have children. Genesis 31, and when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, give me children or else I die. And of course he got mad because he said, I can't, what, uh, what can I do? But she was desperate. That desperation got the attention of God. And in verse 22, it says, And God remembered Rachel, and God hearkened to her and opened her womb, and she conceived and bare a son, and, and said, God hath taken away my reproach. I tell you, you can, your, your sincerity, when you've got to hear from God, when you've got to touch God, that sincerity gets the attention of God. There are times in your life when desperation will cause you to press in and make sure you have the attention of God in your hour of need. Does God still help women have babies supernaturally today? You bet he does. I've believed God for children, for a number of women in this church who have those children today. In fact, a bunch of them are grown up and adults now and getting married and having their own children. And one of, one of them's on our staff that I help believe in. Yes, he can still supernaturally open the womb of women who want children in response to their faith. I've seen it time after time after time. We even have outright miracles in the arena of women conceiving. We have someone right here at Cornerstone who lacks the equipment to be able to conceive and yet God supernaturally caused her to conceive and they have children totally puzzling the doctors who can't figure out how she conceived because she doesn't have all the equipment that you need to conceive. And yet... God did it for her. Glory to God. I'm not talking about things in the Bible. I'm not even talking about things that happened, you know, in the, a couple hundred years ago. I'm talking about things that have happened in the last few years right here in Madison, Alabama. God can work out for you whatever miracle you can believe him for. God can return lost things supernaturally to you. I'm looking tonight at unusual miracles. 2 Kings 6, 4. So he, referring to Elisha, went with them. 2 Kings 6, 4. So he, Elisha, went with them. And when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. 
But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water and he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place. And he cut down a stick and cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. What? Therefore, said he, take it up to thee. And he put out his hand and took it. Listen to me. There is no kind of wood that you can throw in a body of water and make iron rise to the surface. That was a miracle. The man was desperate. He lost something that he had borrowed. It was a borrowed iron axe head. And God made a way for him to get back that which was lost and to be able to return it to the person from whom he borrowed it. I could spend the rest of the night telling you story after story after story of how God brings things back to people. We had a dear lady who was a part of our body for many years, and her name was Christine Johns. She's still somewhat of a legend around here. We truly love that lady dearly, but she was notorious for leaving her keys places. I don't mean once or twice, but a lot. She was always calling the church office trying to get Pastor Mark to agree with her. That whatever she'd left, wherever she'd left, it would come back to her. And you know what? It did. Every time, 100% without fail as far as I know. Now listen, you may think that's silly, but not if it's your stuff you lost. When I can't find something, I always ask the Lord to show me where it is and to return it to me, and he does. But I can tell you from personal experience, first you got to get your frustrated mind and emotions quiet. Because that's the only way you can clearly hear that still small voice on the inside of you. When Pastor Mike and I first started out in the ministry, we made very little money. We lived on faith and love. Glory to God. Wouldn't trade that time. Wouldn't want to do it again. But I would if I needed to. But one day while I was getting ready, I dropped a contact lens and I didn't have another one. And I looked and I shook out my clothes and I shook out the rug and I looked and I did everything and I looked in the sink and looked on the countertop and couldn't find it anywhere. And it was all I had. So I asked the Lord for help. And as I quieted myself, he spoke to my heart and he said, get down on the floor. I said, what? He said, get down on the floor and put your face on the floor. So I got down on the floor, and I put my face on the floor. He said, now look around. I'm laying on the floor. Here's the floor. From that perspective, I could see the contact lens sitting on a rug in the room. He brought my contact back to me. And I know you're thinking, Pastor Rhonda, that's such a little thing. It is, but when you don't have any more and you need it, it's a big deal. He was there for me. You know, Pastor Mark tells a story of his contacts, and it sounds like we're always losing contacts, and I'm sure we've lost our fair share because I found one stuck to the floor the other day. But he was going on a missions trip. This was long before we were married. He was still at his mom and dad's house, and he, he lost a contact, and it's all he, all he had, and he had no time or money, right, to get, to get a replacement pair of contacts. And so he prayed, and he looked, and he searched, and he tried, and he, you went down to get your mom to help you. Uh, I'm looking at him to make sure I'm telling the story right. And, and he asked the angels to bring it back, and he prayed, and he was believing God. And when he got back upstairs, that contact lens was back in the case with orange carpet fibers attached to it, and there's orange carpet on the floor. An angel found that contact 
and put it back in the case. God can help you find lost things. He can bring back to you that which is lost. You know, uh, I was asking him about Kathy um, Knight, Pastor Kathy Knight, who they've been here at the church, and uh, she and her husband are just a marvelous, marvelous people. I love to listen to her stories. Girlfriends got some stories. But she was in a restaurant, and she wears rings on every finger. Well, she went into the restroom of the restaurant and was washing her hands, and when she did, she took all of her rings off. Did she throw them away, or did she just leave them? Do you remember? Remember? She just left them, forgot them, walked out after she washed her hands, dried her hands, walked out, went home. Uh, and when she called back to the restaurant, they were nowhere to be seen. You know, she couldn't find them. They weren't, you know, they weren't in the trash that she could see. I mean, nobody knew what happened to her rings. Well, she was upset. She was believing God. She asked the Lord, Lord, you can bring those back to me. I know you can. And she was believing God. And when a few days later or, or a little while later, she was running the vacuum in her house and hit something and looked down and her pile of rings was on her living room floor. Well, how did that happen? I don't know. Some angel went to the dump and got them, it'd be my guess. Oh, Pastor Rhonda, do you really believe that? You bet your boots I believe it. How could that happen? Because we serve a supernatural God. Stop limiting him. You don't have to figure out how he's going to do it or even how he got it done. You just got to believe. God can return things to you that you need returned. Miracles are not restricted to healing miracles or provisional miracles. God has performed all sorts of miracles, and he's still the same God today. Now listen, it reminds me again of another story that, you know, Pastor Knight and his wife told us. They were traveling somewhere, and it was the middle of the night, and all of a sudden they looked, and they were out of gas. And they're on the highway in the middle of the night. And there was no gas stations. You know, you can get out in places where there's no gas for, you know, 50, 100 miles. And they were literally out of gas. And so they didn't know what to do. So they agreed together. And they were believing that they were going to keep going until they could find gas. And so they drove. And they drove. And they drove. Do you know how long they drove? A long time. They drove with no gas in the car. And finally, Pastor Knight says, oh, Kathy, I just can't believe anymore. And the moment he said it, they sputtered to a stop. Literally had to pull their coasting car off on the shoulder of the road in the middle of the night because he let go of his faith. She was so mad. She said, you're walking for gas. I'm staying here because she would still been believing. I tell you, God can work all kinds of miracles on your behalf. Don't limit him. What do you need, big or small? I think he delights in you including him in the small things of your life too. Everything, every day he ought to be included in. I think if you did that, he'd work all kinds of miracles for you. Exodus 15, 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. The water was no good. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah, which means bitter. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. And there he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. Someone brought me an article 
which allegedly disproves this biblical story. It said that scientists have studied the indigenous trees in that area of the world, and there are none that would make bitter water sweet if they were thrown in. And so they said, see, this disproves the Bible. And I'm like, what? It just, it made me laugh at how uneducated they are in the ways of God. How natural their thought process is. Listen to me. The mere fact that they can't find a natural explanation for how God did something does not disprove the scriptures. They're just not smart enough to figure it out. Ooh, did I say that? Just because you can't explain how he does it doesn't mean he didn't do it. God never said he planted trees all around that bitter water that would make it sweet. No. He showed Moses a tree and said, throw that one in. That doesn't mean there was anything special about that tree at all. It doesn't mean there was any quality inherent within that tree that would make the water sweet. No, what it means is that as he obeyed and he picked up the tree, God said, and threw it in the water, that act of obedience alone was enough to trigger the supernatural intervention of God on their behalf and change the water irrespective of the tree. Their obedience triggered the miracle. It wasn't the tree. It was their obedience. God was working a miracle for his kids. And that ordinary tree resulted in extraordinary results that day because they threw it in at his command. Obedience. Obedience. When he turned the water into wine, the pots were filled with just regular old water. There was nothing supernatural about that water. It was just water. And when they drew the water out, pulled some of that regular old water to take to the governor of the feast, their act of obedience triggered a miracle. And by the time they got to the governor of the feast, that regular old water was turned into wine with no reasonable explanation of how such a thing could happen. Just because we can't explain how he does it, just because science can't explain how he does things doesn't mean he doesn't do them. You don't have to know how or when to get a miracle. You just got to believe. The how is up to him. If you're hung up, well, I don't see how he could do that. You don't got to see it, baby. You just got to trust him. You just got to trust that he will because he said he would. How is up to him. God has a thousand ways where we can see not one. And when we've come to the end of all our ways, his ways have just begun. i tell you where I got that, but I've been saying it all my life. Found it when I was a kid, and I don't know who said it. Jonah and the whale. Oh, my goodness. I've heard several times, there is no whale species with a stomach large enough to house a human being. Therefore, that story in the Bible cannot possibly be true. But hold up. Jonah 1.17. Jonah 1, 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish 
to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. The Lord prepared a certain fish just for this occasion. It could be a known species with a birth defect of an extra large stomach that just happened to be swimming by right at the moment when Jonah needed swallowed. The Bible says God prepared a fish. Not that God does birth defects, but you know what I mean. He could have just prepared ahead of time for an extra large stomach in one of the, in one of the whales. Or he could have prepared an entirely new species just for that one occasion. Just to swallow and safely house Jonah. But regardless of how he did it, the scripture says he specially prepared a fish ahead of time to swallow Jonah. I don't have to know how he did it to believe the story. I just know he did. He prepared it ahead of time and had it ready for that instant that Jonah went overboard. Just because we can't explain how he did it doesn't mean he didn't do it. Listen, I realize people scoff at us. I realize the fact that we believe God has done and still is doing miracles freaks people out. But you know what? In the end, they're the foolish ones. You can scoff if you want to scoff. All that means is you're going to doubt and do without while I believe and receive. That's all that means. You're going to doubt and do without, and I'm going to believe, and I'm going to receive. And I, I've, I've shared testimonies of people who don't believe, and they say, oh, Pastor Rhonda, that was just a coincidence. But you know what I found? The more I believe God and his word, the more of those amazing coincidences happen in my life. You can call them whatever you want, but I'm going to keep walking in them. We don't have to know how. You just have to know that he will. The how is up to him. Listen, every day, all of your life, take it all to him. Let him walk with you and talk with you and share your life every day. Give him everything that you are, everything that you have. Include him in everything that you do and you'll begin to see him show up and show out in your life. I've seen it time after time after time. I got a hold when I was a teenager of a book by Brother Hagen on the authority of the believer. It blessed me, and I didn't even know who Brother Hagen was at that time. And I said to my mom, oh, my gosh, I got so many good things out of that book. And no discredit to my mom, but she says, you could not get that much out of that book. Almost talked me out of what I got. But you know what? We didn't have much money. We was relatively po. And one day our hot water heater quit. And my mom just cried because we had no money to replace it. And so I said, Father, I remember that book. So I'm going to go out there in the utility room. And I'm laying hands on that hot water heater. And I'm asking you to heal it because we don't have any money to get that thing fixed. I went out into the utility room laid my hands on that hot water heater and commanded it to work in Jesus' name. The Lord spoke up in my heart and he said, what would you do if I had healed it? Because we'd been several days taking cold showers. This wasn't just an instantaneous out and then I laid hands on it. It'd been several days. He said, what would you do if I'd fixed it? And I said, well, I suppose I'd go get a shower. He said, then go get a shower. Now, you just heard me say, the hot water ain't working. 
I personally do not like ice cold showers. But I knew God had spoken to my heart, so I went and I got in the shower and I turned the water on and I sat there shivering, saying, I believe, Father, that you're healing this hot water heater. And with my hand before God, by the time I got out of that shower, the water was hot and that hot water heater worked until the day my mother sold that house like 15 years later. I am not lying. We only limit when we don't include him. When we don't take all of our problems to him and see what he would have us do about them. We're living such a life lower than he wants us to live. When he's a part of your everyday life, the miraculous can be commonplace. I could tell you story after story after story of things God has done when we included him into the every day of our life. Pastor lived in Texas and the air conditioning went out in his car and it was hot. He laid his hands on that air conditioner, commanded it to work in Jesus' name. This was long before he was in the ministry, and his air conditioner kicked back in. Glory to God. I tell you, when you're sweating and you don't like to sweat, you can get in faith in a hurry. Pastor Ron, do you really think God cares about all that? I know he does because he cares about you. He cares about you. And he wants to be included in your life. And he wants to bring your life up to a higher level in this year of 2020. Take it all to him. Believe him for the miraculous. Believe him to intervene when you don't know what to do. And he will. He will. The greatest miracle of all is for you to be born again, changed on the inside, to have a fresh start with God, to get all of your sins washed away and forgiven. And that miracle is available for you tonight. If you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you've never been born again, if you've never gotten your sins forgiven, then you have the opportunity for a fresh start in life right now. If that's you and you want to receive him right now, then I want you to pray this after me and mean it with all of your heart. Father God, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that he died on the cross for my sins. I receive him as my Savior, and I make him the Lord of my life. Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. Cleanse me. Make me new. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Now listen, if you once walked with God, but you have walked away and you've not been serving him, you can come home tonight. He is not mad at you. He wants to take you in his arms and love away your pain and love away your fear and love away everything that you've been going through. But you have to come to him. He's a gentleman. He's a gentleman. He comes when you ask him to come. So if you want to come home tonight, then I want you to pray this after me and mean it with all your heart. Father God, I'm coming home tonight. I repent from all the sins that I've been committing. I am so sorry, Father. 
I ask you to wash me clean. I ask you for a fresh start tonight. I'm coming home, and I will serve you all the days of my life. You said, Father, that if I would confess my sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And so tonight, I believe that is true of me. I thank you, Father, for cleansing me and restoring me as your child. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Listen, if you've not been walking with him like you should, reminded me of a, a lady that came in and asked for counseling. Well, her pastor called us and said, can you counsel my people? We're too close to them, and they're having trouble, and they need help. So I did, we didn't even know these people. And before they came in the office, the Lord said to me, say this to her first before she says anything. Just tell her I miss her. Just tell her I miss her. So when they came in the office, before they could even say anything, I said, I don't even know you. I don't know your stories. I don't know who you are. But God told me to tell you something. And I looked her right in the eye. And I said, God misses you. He told me to tell you. He misses you. She told me years later, she said, Pastor Rhonda, that moment changed my life forever. Just when I was praying there, seemed to me the Lord needed somebody else to hear those words. Listen, he misses you. He misses the times that the two of you shared together. Decide tonight to come home because he misses you and he wants you to come home.